Welcome to this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live, the show which ensures that you profit from your time spent here with experts, either through their industry insights, information, or simply learning from them. And today we have Robert Poole joining us live from Phoenix, Arizona, USA. He is the co-founder of Total Business Results, and he helps entrepreneurs who are tied to their businesses make the transition from operator to owner in their business so they can finally achieve the freedom they got into entrepreneurship in the first place. Welcome to the show, Robert. Yes, thank you very much, AJ. Pleasure to be here. You are welcome to the show. You are welcome to India. And I'm sure not just in Arizona or India, but a lot of people all across the globe will benefit from what we are going to talk about. We'll be talking about how one can get free from being tied to their business. And that is where. So my first question to you, Robert, is to understand for the audience is that is this freedom in business is this really possible? If, my, if I understand, even a lot of promoters want to be free from their business and then they get into management roles. Obviously, they are finding that it is they themselves who can run their business properly. Help us understand, you know, this whole gamut of being free from their business so that a lot of people, especially small entrepreneurs, can find some freedom that they actually started Yes, absolutely. And uh, then the, the bottom line is, yes, just about any business uh, can change from a business that is uh, where you are the role of the operator, where you're involved in the day to day, you're doing the thing, so to speak, uh, to the point where, you know, you can uh, take off for, you know, a month and your business not only survives uh, when you come back, but it actually grows. And uh, it's actually not that difficult. Uh, it can take a little time depending on where you are. But it's an achievable goal for just about anybody in business and particularly in small business owners. I mean, let's face it. Most of us got into entrepreneurship because we thought we wanted freedom. We didn't want a boss, you know, all those things. And what do we end up getting most of the time? We end up buying ourselves a job where uh, we, we may not have a, a boss somewhere else, but we're there at the company 60 hours a week uh, tied to it and can't take vacation, uh, you know, stressed out and all that stuff. And, I, uh, I learned from personal experience. And uh, so the, the lessons I've learned are, are not uh, theory, the things that I actually picked up along the way and uh, were fortunate enough to learn the last few years in particular. Absolutely, absolutely. So how can one get started? What is the best way? Because uh, when you start your business, you want to scale it up. When you scale it up, then the business needs you much more. How do you find to even look at yourself where you are, whether you are an operator or even an owner in the right sense? Yes. Well, I, you know, obviously you have to evaluate where you are because it is a spectrum. Um, you know, uh, there's if you are completely out of the business and you don't touch anything, you don't know what's going on. That makes you more of an investor. So what we're talking about is having the flexibility to not be necessary day to day. So when you start out. Um, you know, most of us start our businesses and because we have a specialty in doing something. And so it might be just us. And then, you know, eventually we might hire a contractor that helps with things or more than one. And then possibly that first employee. And it kind of grows from there. So it depends on where you start, of course. But, you know, there's really things. There's four things that I focus on in helping entrepreneurs change, because these are four things I did, um, you know, and they start, of course, with the mentality that you have to change your role and your mentality in the business. You have to become, you know, somebody who focuses on the strategic part of the business on stepping back from the day to day operations. Uh, and that's a very difficult thing to do when you first start out, because most of us, you know, we have a hard time delegating. We are the ones that want to be involved in things on a daily basis. Uh, that's just our natures because we're we're entrepreneurs. Um, and so we have to change our mentality and realize our role is to grow the company, not to do the thing. And it's sometimes easier to do the thing, to stuff the envelopes for a mailer, to run that ad on social media. Um, and so we have to realize and be OK with stepping away. Uh, so that's the, the first step is really a mentality change. And then the second is, of course, recruiting people and a team to help you build that, you know, with, um, you know, any company. 
really the, the biggest asset for a small business owner, I believe that the biggest asset a company has is not your cash in the bank. It's not your list of customers. It's the team you have behind you because you can get sued out of business. You can lose everything you have. But if you have the right people with you, you can quickly rebound and grow that company back to where it was in even greater heights. So people is what it's all about. And of course, what is one of the most difficult things in small business? Hiring and managing and keeping great people. And so that's something that I've you know learned through trial and error 25 years how to do and and there's the right way to do it and the wrong way and I did it the wrong way for many years. Uh, so there's real specific ways to do that. Um, and then you also have to um, change the the culture of the company to be focused on when it, so everybody is on the same uh, uh, playing or everybody's on the same page as far as sales and marketing. Everybody understands things like, you know, how to deal with customers properly, you know, so if you have technical people, you know, they need to be trained in how to deal with um, customers or they need to be trained in how to deal with other departments in your company so that um, they can sort of speak to each other and, and understand each other where a lot of times we end up siloing different departments, um, you know, and then the final, what you were talking about, AJ, um, the scaling of the business, you have to take the mentality when you start the business that everything has to be done with the intention of being able to scale it. If you can't scale something you're doing, meaning if you if if something you're doing works for 10 customers, but you can't do it with a thousand, you probably shouldn't be doing it as much as it it um, you know is tempting to be able to do that because you know most businesses, let's face it, when we start out, we'll take anybody's money who's green, you know, for you know in dollars, um, you know, so to speak. So um, we've got to resist some of these temptations. So it's it's really a process. It's an ongoing process. It can take, you know, it probably took me in our business, which is a multi-million dollar business, it probably took us two years to get there. Um, so it doesn't happen overnight, uh, just like losing weight, but uh, it can be done with just about any business, depending on where you're at. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how much time does it normally take to transition from an operator to be a, to an actual owner? It, you know, it, it, I think the the biggest roadblock I've found in our with our clients is the the actual uh, entrepreneur themselves. If they are are willing to, to break through some of that that natural tendency to hold things back and to want to work in the business, you know, because as I said, a lot of us get in a business because you know we're a, a great engineer or we're a great software developer or you know, and we want to continue to do that. So if we have that resistance. Uh, that that fights that it's going to take longer, but I would say probably your average small business, you know, maybe you've already got one or two employees. I, I would say you can you can really turn things around in a matter of you know six months to a year. Um, you know, it may take a little bit longer if you have a bigger organization. But the biggest driver again is the commitment of the the founder and the entrepreneur to really make those changes, uh, make that change in their mentality. Because really, your business is only going to grow to the extent that you do. So if you're focused on that, doing that thing and won't give that up, it's going to take longer. Uh, so it's, it is a spectrum, but it, it really is driven by the entrepreneur. Absolutely. So what, what do, does the owner or business owner or founder, do they need special skill sets? See, you have an army background, if I understand. And, yes. and with that, you have that mindset to get things done out, either outside or within yourself, you have that uh, th that sense of a much more discipline. What about owners? They not everybody has that sense of losing control. Or is it what is it that is required? Because uh, it sounds easy that you can uh, begin to uh, move away from being an operator to an actual business owner. But does it work for everybody? What has been your experience is it 100 percent successful or is it that some people are made of different stuff and it's very difficult to change them they will always be an operator you know um I, in my experience most of the people that i have worked with have been able to make that transition but i, I also tend to work with people who are very committed to that idea who were frustrated with their current situation you know they're they're working 60 hours a week and they they're just not enough time in the day um, you know, they, they can't seem to move the company forward. Um, you know, so they're, they're at the point where they're like, I have to do something. 
um, you know, if you're in a position where, let's say you're a solopreneur, so to speak, and, you know, um, you're, you're happy with your um, situation, you don't know, you're not that motivated. Uh, and so motivation is really what it comes down to. Um, so it works if you want it to work. Like most things in life, if you're dedicated to the idea, if you buy into the idea, um, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, because we're all disciplined. I think that's where sometimes we get confused, you know, it's, uh, are we disciplined in habits that are moving our business forward? Or are we disciplined in habits that are going to flatline our business? Um, you know, it's just like anything in life, you know, we're, we're disciplined to eat junk food or we're disciplined to, to eat healthy, you know? Um, so uh, I don't I don't think it's necessarily discipline. It's about motivation, I think, would be the, the bigger issue. And that's that's what I've seen so far. Right, right. Let's look at it from the owner perspective. If you or anyone has to tell the owner, listen, you must uh, move away from your business. This is going to help you. This is going to help you in these ways. All I can think right now is more about time freedom. What are the other benefits that an owner can derive if they, you know, uh, delink a bit them from their business? How does that work? What are the other things? Maybe it's not, I don't know, no one knows. And you, when you say that may just strike their mind. Yes, um, I, I think uh, it not only affects the, the owner, the, the big thing that appeals to to entrepreneurs, uh, of course, is the freedom that you gain back from it, of course. But there's a lot of ancillary benefits too. If you set up the the company correctly, everybody benefits. That includes all your employees, the people you work with, your contractors that work with you. Um, that includes your your clients and your customers, uh, because when you when you set up the the company correctly to function on its own, it becomes a sellable asset. But and by nature, the only way to do that is to set up processes, uh, to set up automation, um, to set up a mentality, a buy-in of where everyone feels like they're a little bit of an owner, um, you know, as part of the team. And so they take ownership of their jobs and they do a better job and they get more um, fulfillment out of doing their job. Uh, and when they come into work, they're excited to come into work because one of the critical things for us to be able to remove ourselves from the business as necessary it doesn't mean we can't work in the business it means we don't have to um is creating a the right culture the culture where people are excited to come to work where it, they know they're part of something they know they're making a difference in their their customers lives and because of that the customers benefit because they get the full attention they get the very best of what the team at the company has to offer so they benefit uh from you know what we're doing as a company the people who are as part of the company, the team benefits from the fulfillment, from the all the things that they're looking for, you know, as um, you know, employees, because you know they've done studies over and over again that money is not the number one factor for most people when they come to work. It's do they feel part of something, or do they feel like they're making a difference? Um, you know, um, what are they doing? How are they impacting the world? All those things, and that can't be done if, again, if you're um, you know, in charge and doing everything yourself and trying not letting people grow. So, you know, it, again, it's not just the business owner, it's all the people around you. Um, and you're also able to uh, do other things that, you, you know, if you're stuck working in the business, you know, most of the day, you don't have a chance to really um, look at the company from a big picture. How are you going to impact the world? How are you going to impact your customers more? All those things, you don't have time for that if you're working in the day-to-day -day as an operator so um so it really has a, a lot of ancillary benefits as well right right does it when we talk of you know uh losing a bit of control and actual getting getting actual control of your business does it always have to be about uh you making it almost like a saleable asset maybe a lot of owners don't want to sell their company at all and maybe they want to create value, but do not look at it from that point of view. How does this idea sell to How do you sell this idea of making or not making it a saleable asset? Yes, you're absolutely correct. And, and in fact, uh, most of the clients that I work with and, and the entrepreneurs that I run into have no intention of selling um, anytime soon. You know, that 
they, you know, they could be, you know, in their twenties or they could be in their forties. Uh, and they're like, Hey, I'm, I'm not, I'm happy to do this. It, me personally, uh, I, I probably will work until I die because, uh, I'm, I enjoy this. This is my life. Uh, I'm the guy who thinks about business. Every time I walk into, you know, a retail store at night, I'm wondering about their margins and how they make their money. How do they hire people? So I like it. Um, so I don't want to retire. And, uh, but to answer your specific question, um, even if we don't plan on selling it, it, we still want to act as if we are trying to sell it someday, because doing that has all those other ancillary benefits, creates that freedom for the owner to be able to do the important things, what it's important to you in life, you know, uh, maybe it's to spend more time with your family or, you know, uh, financially get you set up, that sort of thing, take that pressure off you, um, give you back your freedom. Um, you know, and that can only be done by creating that asset that's actually worth something. Uh, so it's it's almost um, creating a sellable asset is a way to think about it, um, but it's not necessarily the end game. It's a uh, ancillary benefit or a, a side effect of changing your company, if you will. So it's, uh, as I said, I have actually very few uh, clients who have any intention of selling. Um, it's more of a... a um, effect of what happens when you do make that change, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, if there are a, a couple of founders into that company or partners, like you had a partner who hmm. unfortunately passed away and then you gain a lot of uh, expertise or understanding of this whole business. They say that we are running fine. Whenever we need time, we, we are able to take it and that works fine for them. How does it work? Is it only for single owner companies or is it for also, you know, multi owner companies? Yes, I, I think it applies to both. And I, I certainly have experience in both. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, I had a business partner for uh, almost 20 years and uh, and we did exactly what you said. You know, we um, one of us would go take time off and the other one would cover duties and that sort of thing. So we never really we never really thought about it. Um, and we had that that crush mentally. Uh, and then one day I woke up, um, came to work and my business partner didn't show up and turns out he had passed away with a heart issue. Um, and so suddenly that, and that's really what triggered this whole whole concept and my drive to find out because I knew uh, I could not be tied to the company. I knew in the long run, I would not survive this if I didn't change. Um, so to answer your question, I think even if um, you have multiple partners in a business. Let's say you even have three. So, you know, if you have a situation like mine where one of the partners died, obviously you still have two more. Um, but I think, again, it's not so much um, the freedom is part of it, but it's all the other effects. It's creating that internal culture of ownership. Uh, it's giving the, the customers the best uh, possible experience they can um, and doing those things that, that do give the the founders or the partners freedom, uh, but it's all those other benefits that you want those things anyway. So um, it doesn't really matter, you know, if you have multiple partners, um, it gives everybody freedom, of course, as the partners, um, but it really be, it really is the, the biggest thing, I think anyway, is how you grow as a company, what kind of company you become, and that, you know, what kind of employees do you have? What kind of team do you have? And what is their mentality? Again, if you have multiple partners, it doesn't really matter because you're leaving a legacy um, with those people, with, you know, your particular families, all those things. So it doesn't matter if it's just one of you or if it's multiple people. Uh, I think that the lessons and the, the benefits that you get out of it and everybody around you gets out of it or get out of it uh, really override uh, any even your own freedom, if you so to speak, if that makes sense. Absolutely. What about, you know, a uh, very small company, solopreneurs, a speaker, an author. Uh, you know, generally people, the answer is for smart, slightly larger companies is that nowadays everything is about fractional, fractional CMO, fractional CO, everything fractional. So does that work for small companies or there are much more automation tools? They say that they can free you from your day to day business. Does that work here? And for smaller companies, how, how does uh, individuals, how does that work? Or is it not required in their situation? No, I, I think, um, you know, on, on the surface, it would seem like, like you said, if you're an author, why would you need to worry about this? Uh, 
you know, and, and that sense, you you are creating, or you and you do have an asset in that sense you know, because you've got a book or whatever. Um, but I think that's where it becomes, if you really want to make an impact, um, your uh, what you're doing becomes more of a brand than it does um, become, you know, just an asset. And so, typically, even if you're an author, a solopreneur, and you don't have any employees, um, and use the, the author example. Um, you will always have contractors and people who are assisting you, teams that that help you do anything. Uh, because um, let's say you're an author and you want to go on a speaking tour to, to sign books, you know, and and maybe speak at a few things or whatever to promote your book. You're going to need people that help you with that, and people believe in you and they believe in what you're doing. And so it's the same thing. They may not be technically employees, but they're also people that are part of your movement, so to speak, part of promoting what you believe in, what you're teaching. And so you're still creating that team. And as you create that team, it allows you to have a bigger impact. And you can you can uh, eventually walk away from that. And just the team and the brand will function by itself with very minimal, um, you know, uh, actual daily work from you, so to speak. Um, but again, you have to look at it. So that would be a solopreneur, on to, like an author example. Let's say you are just very small. You're starting off. Um, you know, one of the, the biggest um, influences on my business career as a young man, uh, I, if you've ever read the book, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber, um, and he talks about this concept of how to scale and how to create your business with processes and systems and automation and all that things. And we, I think that's really one of the things that help us grow or helped us grow into a multi-million dollar company was um, implementing some of those principles when it was just the two of us. And then when we hired one employee, we started putting processes in place because we always looked at it as, like I, I mentioned earlier, if does this work for one customer? Does it work if we have 10? Does it work if we have a thousand? Um, you know, how are we going to deal with that? And if we couldn't figure out a way to deal with that, at least have some idea in the future, then we didn't pursue that idea. And I think that that really helped us. And so, you know, um, most of us, when we're starting out, we do plan on growing. Uh, so you've got to take that mentality from the beginning, regardless of your size, and it will grow you so much faster by putting those systems in now, because, you know, it's much easier to uh, turn a speedboat 180 degrees than it is to turn an ocean liner. So you don't want to wait until you're a, a large company with 50 employees. You want to start when it's just you. And you put those processes in place, put that automation in place, all those things that are necessary. Right. So does does processes and systems only mean uh, bots, chatbots, and systems, and no no humans involved? Because that's the way we are going. A lot of automation is happening now with the AI coming in. Virtual assistants have actually gone virtual in sense that you can hire those AI and they would act as your employees or your team members, you know, so those things. So how does this part of, you know, moving from an operator to a business owner work? Does it involve hiring more people or does it involve hiring more chatbots? I, I think, um, and, you know, all of us are, are really curious and fascinated by this whole AI revolution and where we're going to be in 10 years. And uh, I think it's, it's fascinating. Um, but the way I look at it, technology is a tool for people, not the other way around. And AI will never replace human beings, in my opinion, uh, because you always need somebody behind the scenes um, to make those strategic decisions. AI can only make decisions based upon the data it has. Um, and a lot of that comes down to uh, personal preference, uh, it, it, um, intuition, things like that, that are that you can't really replicate that even in an AI scenario. And so I think that um, all these tools that we have, automation, those are things that that allow us to and allow our employees to break free from the mundane, from the the things that don't matter, to be able to focus on the things that do matter, focus on the strategic level ideas, um, coming up with new innovations, things like that. That um, you know, a tool is not going to do. All it does is replace repetitive tasks and things that you know that are being done that uh, could be done faster uh, by a machine, so to speak. And so I think there's there's an emphasis on uh, automation, but we forget about automation is just a tool in a process. 
process is what makes the difference. Process is what makes us money. And so if we have a process and it's backed up by tools that can take pieces of that process, um, it still needs humans behind it to create that process, uh, in my opinion. Absolutely. Absolutely. There is much to learn about all these things as we go, go along, and especially in, the, in, uh, in terms of artificial intelligence. Be that as it may, tell us a bit about your company, Total Business Results. What does it do? And who, who is it for? Who are the type of people who can connect with you for getting answers to their problems? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Total Business Results, um, as I mentioned, we founded this company almost, uh, 22 years ago. And uh, for many years, we were strictly a B2B cold calling appointment setting uh, firm that specialized in a few industries. And when I had that incident, um, you know, it was about seven years ago now, uh, when my business partner passed away, uh, we started looking at the bigger picture and I started to transition. And I realized our clients, you know, we could generate all the leads we, we wanted. We could get appointments for them. We could do all these things, but a lot of times they needed help in other areas. And we would say, well, sorry, we can't help you with that. Go, you know, over to XYZ company and try them out. And, you know, they may have got a good experience, maybe not. And so we started expanding our offerings to where these days we do educational work. Um, I do personal uh, coaching, group coaching, as well as, you know, a limited one-on-one -on -one just from a time constraint uh, point of view. Uh, we do special uh, educational events. Um, and because we realized that, you know, let's face it, as business owners, we're busy. We don't have time to become an expert in everything. So we need, just like education, you know, getting a, a degree in something, you, you know, the only way you're going to grow is to learn. And so we provide those kind of services. Uh, we also do uh, social media management um, and advertising, that sort of thing. Um, but I think um, my personal focus is on the the coaching and consulting side, just because I, I see the, the greatest fulfillment out of that. Uh, I really enjoy seeing the the direct impact and as somebody takes that step from from operator to owner. And of course, you can find all this about us on you know, our website, totalbusinessresults.com. Uh, so it's the way we look at it is it's a full spectrum what does a small business owner need? And, and when I say small business owner, our typical client will have anywhere from zero employees to up to 20 or 30. Uh, beyond that, um, you know, it becomes a different type of business. Not that we don't work with a few of those, but I would say to answer your question, most of our, our businesses are smaller with just a few employees. So we can help them take that next step because that's really what we want to do is help them grow as a company. Wonderful. With this, it's a wrap on this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. Thank you, AJ.